Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Portico Podcast, a show that explores the landscape of private markets in Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, and Latin America. I'm Mike Casey, the founder of Portico Advisors, LLC, and I'm your host. I'm delighted to kick off the podcast with Aniko Sietbari and I.K. Kanu. Aniko and I.K. are the founding partners of Atlantica Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm focused on six of the largest markets in Sub-Saharan Africa. Aniko has over 20 years of experience investing in emerging markets, of which over 17 have been focused on the technology, media, and telecom vertical. Aniko has been investing in Africa for the past 15 years, and she's built up a wide range of contacts across the continent and other emerging markets. Prior to starting Atlantica Ventures, or AV, Aniko was the global head of the TMT Group at the International Finance Corporation, the private sector development arm of the World Bank Group, where she managed a team of approximately 50 professionals who sat in eight regional hubs from Colombia to Singapore. IK has over 10 years of African private equity experience, with an additional nine years working in technology and consulting in the United States. Prior to starting AV, IK was a principal at Convergence Partners, an Africa-focused TMT fund. And before that, he spent five years with Helios Investment Partners. At both PE funds, IK was seconded to portfolio companies into temporary operational management positions, where he troubleshot issues across different stages, from growth to turnaround. IK is a Class 23 Kaufman Fellow, one of the world's premier innovation, leadership, and venture capital-focused programs. In our discussion today, we talk about why Aniko and IK decided to team up to found a venture capital firm, whether the continent is ready for institutional VC investments, how Africa compares to other emerging markets, and how COVID-19 is impacting the startup landscape in their target markets. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Aniko, IK, how are you? Very well, thank Great. you, Mike. Awesome, awesome. Well, pretty jazzed up for uh, our interview here today because this is the first attempt at uh, at a podcast, and I think what you guys are doing is super interesting, super exciting, and it's a theme that I think a lot of people are keen to learn more about uh, venture in Africa. Um, so uh, we're going to dig into the details on what you do. But you know, first I thought it'd be helpful to frame the conversation by just sort of getting a sense of, of who you are. And so maybe Annika, we could start with you. You know, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, how you got interested in emerging markets and why you became a venture capitalist. Sure, so I'm from Hungary. Um, so I grew up in an emerging market. In fact, um, I firsthand witnessed the fall of the Iron Curtain and the impact it had in uh, transforming the country and the impact the private sector and uh, startups had on the positive economic transformation of the country. So that's really what gave me the impetus of uh, working in emerging markets. Um, so I um, spent about 20 or so years of my career working at a development finance institution, investing in emerging markets. And I got into uh, the venture capital space because this is where I feel there's a very great opportunity um, to accelerate economic development, at the same time do good, and also um, make outside returns as an investor. Um, I much enjoyed over the last 20 years um, assisting our portfolio companies, whether that was uh, helping them to grow their businesses or supporting them overcoming difficulties. And I hope to bring this skill set and passion to supporting the now very vibrant ecosystem in, in the continent of Africa and hope to use my global network and investment expertise to uh, support the growth of the startups. Awesome. And IK, how about you? Well, um, I was born in Nigeria, then moved to the UK to go to school, then the US and um, studied electrical engineering in the US and did my MBA as well. So that got me early into a field whereby I was combining engineering technology alongside with business and really trying to understand what makes a successful business work. And the firm that I used to work for 
which is um, now, which is Lucent Technologies, which unfortunately does not exist anymore, um, housed Bell Labs and one of the leading um, science and technology companies in the world, and yet still struggled in terms of its business model. So just really got me very, very curious as to what makes a good business work. And it's not just about the best mousetrap, it's about the best business model, having the best route to market, et cetera. So that really led me down the field and really understanding how to really take all those things together, science, technology, uh, bring it all together into form of a, a proper and a very competitive business. So that then led me down the route of understanding, well, how does the actual life cycle flow? goes from entrepreneurs, goes through the different stages until it gets to something very big and exciting. And the different parties that support the entrepreneurs along the way change across different levels. You have angel investors, you have VCs, you have growth equity firms. And the VCs, in terms of what they do, the way they help the startups, the way they really get involved, struck a note with me in terms of the right balance between being very hands-on supporting them but also trying to help guide them to the next phase and a combination of operations, a combination of um, finance and other leadership skills, et cetera. So that's really brought me into coming into the VC space. And my love for emerging markets, I'm from Nigeria. I see so much potential across the country. I see so much potential across the continent and each part of the continent going from East Africa to West Africa, Southern Africa, and parts of North Africa as well, they have different flavors and different cultural, um, interesting cultural parts of them that make it very, very exciting from a business model standpoint, from a startup perspective. And you can just play with different models, see different things that would work in one area, may not work in another area, but with different uh, twist. And it's just a very, very exciting and vibrant space. Mm -hmm. And when you just look at the fact that Africa has some of the largest, um, urban populations that are fastest growing a lot of young people is very exciting, very vibrant, and the chance to actually leapfrog a lot of technologies that other developed markets are currently going through right now. Africa is the space to actually really do that leapfrog and go to the next phase. So it's very, very exciting. Awesome. So we've sort of got some of the answers to the next question I have, but you know, what was the impetus for the two of you coming together to found Atlantica Ventures. Yes, Mike, as you mentioned, we're, um, we have looked at uh, uh, Africa and African investment from different vantage points, but concluded the same, which is that there's a real opportunity in supporting the really vibrant startup ecosystem in the continent. There are some macro forces that have really accelerated the development of the startup um, um, ecosystem over the last few years. And I have seen that as I was investing globally, I've seen that picking up more and more the last few years. Um, while at the same time, um, the continent is lagging behind in terms of uh, availability of VC funding. So we saw the opportunity for potentially high return investments, um, while at the same time, uh, a gap on the funding side. Um, and as we both were interested in, in the early stage um, investing space, um, we decided to join together and start Atlantic Ventures. And uh, just to add to that as well, investing in the early stage in Africa gives you the ability to not just make great returns financially, but because small and medium sized businesses are the driving force behind the economies, which in terms of hiring people, financial inclusion, and different other social factors. They'll be very, very beneficial for the entire you know, continent as a whole. Being in the VC space gives you the chance to really get that at the atomic level and really help a lot of these startups, which will eventually grow to become a lot of the large enterprises and corporations that you see um, out there today. So trying to instill these values, trying to help these entrepreneurs grow in the right ethical way and to build up the entire ecosystem, not just from finances, but from an entire um, ethics perspective, is something very, very exciting. And Africa is one of the few places where you can actually do good and also make good returns. Awesome. You know, you know a lot of people, um, perhaps most people, uh, who are unfamiliar with Africa and the pretty rapid transformations that have been taking place across the continent, 
they, they question whether it's even ready for venture capital investments. So, you know, to these, these sort of less informed investors or, or people who've taken a look in the past and, and decided to take a pass on it, you know, what are these people missing? What are they missing in the, in the Africa VC story? They're missing the fact that there's been a convergence of a number of different factors to make VC, the VC space very exciting. So now you have um, increased in mobile penetration, not just 3G, but also 4G with some 5G trials happening. You see an increase in cooperation across the different banking networks. So banks are now opening up their systems to allow other players integrate a lot of startups that are FinTech uh, focused to integrate. And some banks even embracing the uh, open banking API standard as well. You see a reduction in the cost of devices so that people who really want to start a business the cost of entry to creating a business has dropped dramatically just because now they can they could probably afford laptops and afford data now when they couldn't beforehand. And you also just have the pure entrepreneurial spirit that's on the continent. So when you take all that together, then what I said previously, you take the fact that it's a young, urban, vibrant population that's growing and demands a lot of on-demand services that typically could only be delivered by uh, a technology enabled business it creates a system whereby there's such a huge push of activity of different startups going into the ecosystem so you have a lot of angel investors really really pushing uh, startups to help them grow but this is part of the impetus as to why we're then looking at the vc space because these startups then reach a gap whereby they've gone past the angel phase they're now trying to raise significant capital, capital anywhere from half a million dollars, maybe up to $5 million, but there aren't too many VC firms that are really operating in that space there. You have a few that are operating, they have a few firms from the US, uh, Asia, and uh, Europe playing in the space there, but not too many. So these startups struggle to actually get to that escape velocity. On the other side, you have a number of growth equity, private equity firms, part of what my background is, that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars and some into the billions that are looking for pipeline and typically compete over deals. So when you have that value chain of a lot of startups, a huge block between that VC funding stage and then a huge amount of demand waiting for well-structured, well-run companies, it just seems very, very natural that to actually fund this gap there to help these startups grow and then feed the uh, growth equity pipeline. So I believe that's what they're missing there. And uh, other things that they're missing in terms of um, investing or what venture capital is like in Africa is that a lot of the startups are focused on key problems. They're out there with painkillers, not vitamins, really. They understand that they have to get product market fit early they understand that the next funding cycle may not happen. So they need to prove their model quickly and they need to be able to really pivot their business model if it doesn't work or pivot towards profitability if there's a dry spell coming. So the entrepreneurs are really geared to build sustainable businesses that can stand the test of time and not just shooting for the moon all the time without any uh, grounding. Anika, did you want to add anything to that? Maybe just to mention that the ecosystem now has grown quite significantly. There are over 7,000 7, startups uh, providing tech or tech-enabled uh, solutions in the continent, um, tackling all the challenges of um, somewhat inefficient sectors in the economies. Um, and the opportunities are huge because just picking on one sector, transportation, the transportation costs in Africa are two to three times higher than as compared to developed markets. So the opportunity to bring uh, technology in the space um, to enable cutting down on the costs and transportation times is huge. You know, one of the things that I came mentioned earlier was how, you know, East Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, and North Africa have different flavors. and 
you know, I'm sitting here in the United States and oftentimes people talk about Africa as if it's a single market, but it's, it really is incredibly diverse uh, and it's huge. Um, so with that in mind, how have you decided upon your target market? Why did you, first of all, what are they and, and how did you choose them? So a target market, we have six target markets in our uh, strategy in East Africa. Our target markets are Kenya and Tanzania. In Southern Africa, it's South Africa. And in West Africa, we have Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and Nigeria. The reason why we picked these markets because they represent majority of the GDP in the uh, continent, represent majority of the startup ecosystem in the continent, and they represent majority of the VC funding that has flown into the continent. So from um, a target perspective, going into those markets gives you the ability to really see the best of the uh, ecosystem and find opportunities that can really scale and grow within those countries as a standalone. But in addition to that, a lot of these countries are natural trading partners and information partners. So people, ideas, goods and services flow easily across the different markets. And you see that in the startup ecosystem when you see Kenyan companies moving to Tanzania or South African companies moving to Kenya or Nigerian companies doing the exact same thing to Kenya and Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. So those are the reasons why we pick those markets because they represent the flow of information, flow of ideas, flow of people, flow of goods and services. So it just makes more sense to actually follow your customer. And if we believe that the best way to succeed is to really serve the startups, which are your customers, you go where they're going to, you move alongside them and support them as they go along their journey. And that's why we pick these markets. Now, given that you've led direct investments in tech media and telecoms companies across the world, you know, I'm curious, what are the continuities between the tech landscape and say, Atlantica's target markets and those you've seen in other regions, whether it's Latin America, emerging Asia, Central and Eastern Europe? Okay, uh, there are several similarities, I would say. As in other emerging markets, there are significant opportunities to disrupt market inefficiencies and take advantage of gaps uh, by the use of technology um, in the continent. As IK has already touched on, there is an enable, now an enabling environment um, in, the, in our target market that supports um, growth of these startups. This enabling environment um, includes the now almost ubiquitous mobile telecom networks, um, the opening up of the bank's networks, mobile money solutions that are relatively available in a lot of the markets. Um, there are now relatively affordable smartphones and devices in the continent that's all supporting the growth of the startup ecosystem. There's also a large and growing pool of skilled entrepreneurs that are ready to take advantage of these opportunities to build businesses. And while the industry is relatively young in Africa, we are starting to see the emergence of some serial entrepreneurs as well. But what Africa has to offer, in addition to what some of the other emerging markets have to offer, are some very positive macro forces. Our target markets, some of our target markets are some of the fastest growing economies globally. The continent and our markets have the largest and fastest growing urban population and middle class. Africa's popul urban population is uh, growing at four times the rate of the United States, for example, and over 50% of the population is below the age of 25. And all this population growing, young, urbanizing population is looking for tech and tech-enabled services and solutions. So that creates a really great um, uh, enabler for startups. On the flip side of that, how, how is venture investing in Africa different than you've seen in some of the other regions? It is different, at least compared to developed markets. It's different in that venture investing in Africa is not a bet on technology. 
but it's a bet on a business model and the execution capabilities of the founders and management teams to um, house that business model in a lower infrastructure and lower income environment. Um, the entrepreneurs, because it's a, a lower income and lower infrastructure environment, have to make do with less, especially initially, they have to bootstrap their businesses for a lot longer time period, have to be more creative and, and more focused on getting to positive unit economics before they can scale their businesses. You can just scale a business um, and hope that by throwing money at it, you'll actually achieve success. Um, but this challenge of operating in this environment, I see it as also a huge advantage because once you figure this out and you figure out to how, how to provide services to uh, lower income uh, population and businesses that support that lower income population, it is then actually quite easy to then scale and take these businesses to other geographies. And you are now starting to see several African startups uh, going to other emerging markets and, and taking advantage of this, what one would think a disadvantage. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And to add to that, in terms of what the difference is, this is what drives our own approach as an investment thesis. So the approach that some Silicon Valley firms have, which is more about a law of numbers and a spray and pray and hope that a small percentage of their portfolio returns the entire fund and then gets, gets you know, your unicorn status there, which then you know, gives you your three, five, seven X, whatever target the fund has. The approach in Africa has to be different. The spray and pray approach and hope that you can just throw money out there and wait for one or two of your companies in the portfolio to give you your entire fund return, I don't think would work. And this is a result of how the ecosystem in the US has changed because there's a lot of capital chasing a lot of deal, a lot of fewer deals. So the round size have gotten bigger and bigger. The number of startups has grown in the US. So that has then led to a more statistical driven approach to generating your returns than trying to actively work harder with the uh, portfolio companies. So the approach in Africa is different whereby we're not looking at investing in hundreds of companies and trying to just place bets. I hope that a few succeed, but targeted investments in smart entrepreneurs working closely hand in hand with them and that's a true value add that Aniko and I bring, helping them work with different scenarios, if it's in their operations, in terms of refining their product market fit, if it's in terms of even leadership questions, really helping them grow through their business. So that approach makes us be more hands-on and doesn't allow you to then take that spray and pray approach. So that's the difference there whereby we're looking for a more targeted portfolio. And the goal is not to look for the unicorn that can return your entire fund, we're looking to then create a herd of gazelles and zebras that are resilient, are very, very attractive, can get you good returns. The ecosystem could evolve in a few years, but I believe now that this is the right approach in terms of looking at VC investing in Africa and generating those same returns that um, VCs uh, enjoy elsewhere. You know, maybe, you know, you've mentioned a, a variety of the verticals that you're targeting. Maybe you could give us an example of one of your recent investments and, and why you thought it was uh, an attractive investment opportunity for, for the fund. Sure. Uh, we recently invested in a B2B logistics marketplace company called Sandy Limited, based in Kenya and providing services in East Africa. From a business model point of view, we liked it uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, transportation is one of the um, most inefficient sectors in the continent in general. We very much like the company's business model uh, that was providing full uh, stack of services, uh, meaning providing last mile line haul and long haul services um, to B2B customers in Kenya and now in other parts of East Africa. We think the founders and management team are exceptional. 
with a very strong record of execution over the last few years. And the company also has some really high value add um, shareholders. And, and drawing into some of the reasons that we also like it. So when Aniko mentioned the fact that they invest, uh, they have developed different lines. So the last mile typically delivered on motorcycles. Then you have the line haul, which are on smaller trucks and vans and the long haul, which are your larger trailers that go from country to country or one large city to another large city. As a business model, they've been able to actually bring all those three together to really bring the best value to the customers, but also create defensible moats in their business. And then uh, the, the elephant in the room, COVID-19, the, 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 the coronavirus. Now, how has COVID-19 impacted the African startup landscape so far? How are you factoring in its sort of evolution into uh, your investment thesis as you look ahead? I would say from just a whole macro perspective, the COVID-19 has affected us um, just because you know complete slowdown and shutdown in different parts of the economy. And this is in conjunction with the oil price reduction, given the re recent um, battles between Saudi Arabia and Russia, we've driven down the price of oil. So you've had a slowdown of the economy from COVID, but also then a slowdown due to depressed um, prices of uh, natural resources. The interesting thing when it comes to startups is the entrepreneurs have always had uh, the mentality and the belief that the next funding round may not happen. So a lot of startups usually operate in Africa on a very, very lean budget or have the ability to quickly pare down their costs or pivot their business model towards being cash flow positive. So from a startup perspective, because of the nature whereby there isn't that much capital flowing into the VC space, startups in Africa naturally have this always be very, very cautious and safe. So a lot of the startups will have a good amount of runway. So those are the ones that are already existing. Now, the question is, in terms of the new ones that are out there trying to um, fundraise, there will be a challenge because there isn't that much capital flowing in, especially from global markets. So that will have a, an effect in terms of new opportunities coming down the uh, pipeline um, as a result of this uh, temporarily. But the other interesting thing we're looking at is in terms of given the, the impact this has had in terms of the way people live and work. So the uh, terminology, you know, the future of work and future of living, how will people work and live in a new COVID situation. So there's going to be a lot more remote working. Remote working will lead to a lot more fintech um, payments. So instead of people going to different places and paying with cash, you see a lot more fintech solutions coming to the surface. With people working more remote, you see a lot more services delivered uh, over the air. So IoT um, plays become more prevalent there as well. So you see a natural evolution whereby this then changes the way businesses and people operate. And um, our thesis is actually built on top of that. And uh, thankfully enough, our strategy as Atlantica Ventures has been built around key sectors that are more recession proof and will also do well in a, in a post-COVID situation whereby there is more extended, uh, where there may be more extended uh, social distancing measures in place. Got it. And Anika, did you want to add anything? Maybe I would say that as we're actually looking through our pipeline um, within these sectors that I can mention, we're uh, looking at it from two lenses. One is what are the businesses that are likely to not only survive, but grow in the grow in this current uh, climate and environment fueled by people and consumers and businesses moving more online and then businesses that uh, are likely to be able to get to a next fundraising round within the next 18 to 24 
months period. Uh, fundraising is never easy, as I mentioned, anywhere in the emerging markets, in my experience, but particularly in Africa. And in this situation, it's probably going to tighten some. So we're looking to find uh, businesses and business models where we think there's a, the highest likelihood of them being able to raise funding um, uh, or follow on funding in the next kind of year and a half to two years. All right. Boy, you're really uh, preaching to the choir here, talking about how difficult it is to raise funds uh, in, um, in emerging markets at any time. So it's, it's certainly a challenge now. And uh, I don't envy anyone who's, who's going through the process. So why don't, we, why don't we transition now to the rapid fire questions at the end here to bring it to a close and make you extremely uncomfortable as if this, this interview hasn't been uncomfortable already. So <laughs> uh, the, uh, the first one, uh, and I'll let uh, you guys flip a coin to see who answers it first is, you know, do you experience the fear of failure? And if so, how do you either cope with it or overcome it? Um, maybe I'll start. Uh, yes, I do from time to time. The, in this new chapter of my life, the path is definitely uncertain. So there are peaks and valleys. Um, as uh, I go through this new, new path, uh, but I um, believe in ourselves and believe in the thesis of the VC space and VC investing in Africa and very determined to succeed. So when in doubt, I just step into that feeling of determination. And if we face some failure, I just use that to motivate myself to work harder and come up with more creative ways to get to where we want to get to and achieve our goals. I love it. IK? Yes, I do uh, experience fear. I'll say um happens time to time. It's uh, a dose of fear also ke always keeps you on your toes. And I'll say in terms of... The my way of coping with it, of overcoming it. Um, I, I look at it like uh, like any sort of um, uh, vaccine. So you, you take a small vaccine of something that exposes you to it and you somehow build an understanding as, as to how to deal with it. So I just remember the different times when I actually failed. And I remember that, okay, fine, I failed. It was not the end of the world. I recovered and I got better from it. So I just always think back as to the times when I failed. And if I'm then gonna do something, I'll then just remind myself, well, IK, you've done things, some, some things before that have worked well. You've done some things that you've failed and you're still standing. So that's just, uh, just a mental reminder that I've taken that vaccine already. Muy bien. Uh, who has had an enduring influence on you? Maybe we'll start with IK this time. And your influence on me, I'll make it a personal I'll say my sister. Um, my sister and I are very close. Um, I lost my mother when I was just uh, 15 years old. My sister was 16 at the time, but we've always been very, very close. Even when I was a, as a kid, we'll go to birthday parties. Uh, my mom would say, hey, you always go to a birthday party. And when they give out sweets or toys, that she always say that, no, no. My brother needs to get something first before I get something. So she's always been out there looking out for me and just, just always been very, very supportive. And even though she's very successful in all rights with a good career, family, kids that are doing great things, she always finds time to actually put family first above other things. So it's just something that I really, really admire. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. Annika, that's tough to follow up on, Annika. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in tears listening to this. Um, uh, I would say I cannot highlight a single person. Really, I had, uh, I think, many influences along the way. But if you really pushed me, I would say probably also taking it back, back to a personal level, my father, who always... Uh, pushed me to do better and more and better and everything I did and also uh, showing through that that nothing was impossible um, that if I set my eyes on something it was a matter of determination to get there man this is a, these are great answers you know we're all sort of trapped in our houses with our family and here it is the, 
you know, the, the greatest people you can ever have are, are right next to you. It's just a, it's just a wonderful reminder of it. Um, all right. So what's the, not that you guys have had a lot of time to, to, for leisure reading, uh, in recent times as you're, you're getting an entrepreneurial venture underway, but you know, what's the best thing you've read in the last year? Other than our LP agreements and PPM that we're working on. <laughs> yeah. All of that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Well, what I've been reading and uh, just finding some time to do that, it's a, a book by uh, Eric Reese that I got some time ago called The Startup Way. And the reason why I got that is just so that I could put myself in the shoes of the entrepreneurs, put them, you know, myself in the shoes of the startups to understand what they're going through so that I don't come from a point of view whereby they think I'm entitled that, oh, you've never done this before, but really try to understand their struggles and get examples of what other startups have gone through so that when I'm speaking to them, trying to give them advice, I have multiple reference points that can actually uh, draw from rather than just my own points of view. So that's just what I'm, I'm going through right now. Um, so not a whole lot of time to read books on my side, but I have been, um, I'm a very curious person. I like to read about different parts of the world. So I've been recently, as Ike well knows, been, uh, reading a lot <laughs> about uh, Yakutia or the Saka Republic in uh, uh, northeast of Russia. I find that place fascinating. I randomly bumped into it because they recently unearthed, I think, uh, a few kind of prehistoric animals there. So I've been reading up a lot about it. Um, it's um, a republic the size of, that fits in Europe. Uh, or Europe fits in it, but only has about less than a million people. And funnily enough, as I uh, started reading more, about, more and more about it, I realized there's actually a Nigerian living in the capital, Yakutsk, um, I think in the agricultural trade. So if you ask me what has been my kind of deepest learning and reading of it, that's definitely it. To the extent wow. that my family actually got me a T-shirt recently that said "I love Yakutsk" on it. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is delightfully random. And then, um, you know, what do you do to recharge? I like to dance samba, uh, or when I have a chance to go to the beach and swim in the ocean. And I would have said in the past, love travel too, but now I do travel. The last 20 years I've been doing travel for a living. So <laughs> that's probably less so these days. Yeah, had your fill. And for me, it's just to go to the gym. So if it's just weights or doing CrossFit, uh, I'll say that's how I recharge. I used to do a lot of Muay Thai, Thai boxing Ooh. back then, but I haven't done much of it lately. But anything physical like that just helps me recharge. Nice. Awesome. Well, this has been great. Um, I, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed getting to know you guys in, in a different way. Uh, it's always, it's always been about business, 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 but now there's, uh, there's more personal items here and it's, it's quite a lot of fun. You know, just as we wrap things up, you know, where would you point people to either learn more about Africa's startup landscape and or uh, Atlantic Ventures? So um, there are different uh, resources. Uh, what I'd say is what we have our website is www.atlanticaventures.com. Uh, look us up there, see our thesis, and learn what we're about in our portfolios. And there are a number of different, um, I'll say, organizations that really try to pull together the venture capital ecosystem. So APCA is one of them. That's A-V-C-A. Um, as a resource, and there's also VC for ACTA as well. So those are some places where you can actually learn about the ecosystem. And um, there are a number of different exciting accelerators and incubators that are really cropping up uh, across the board. And um, so I'll say the best way is just to really get in, in contact with a number of startups that you've probably read about, even on TechCrunch. And just reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I just want to learn a little bit more about what you're doing and what you're seeing. But the good thing about a lot of the startups is that we are, they're always happy to talk. They just want to tell their story, just get more people as excited as they are, and just point you in the right direction. Awesome. Well, unless, Annika, do you have anything to add there? Uh, just in terms of quick kind of um, daily news, um, 
other than TechCrunch. I think there are lots of them now in the continent. Um, the ones that I usually um, read are Tech Cabal, Baobab Insights, pretty good Quartz Africa, that's weekly on the weekends. We tracker Brighter Bridges has some really interesting and nice maps about the ecosystem. So I would probably recommend looking at those. Well, we've now got, now everybody has their homework uh, to go and uh, do their own research and, and get jazzed up about the opportunity. So I don't go, Nike, thanks for making the time. I know it's uh, it's tough to do and it's tough to find a quiet space in a household with uh, with kids, but I think we've managed mm -hmm. to pull this off. So thanks for doing it and uh, good luck. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Mike. Same to you and thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Mike. Pleasure right. speaking again and hope to speak again soon. Take care. Ciao. Hi, everyone. This is Mike again. Thank you for listening. I hope you found the conversation edifying. And if you have any feedback, whether it's good or bad, please send me an email at mike at porticoadvisors.com. If you're keen to learn more about private markets developments across the emerging markets, then smash that subscribe button on your podcast player. And please visit our website, porticoadvisors.com. That's P-O-R-T-I-C-O-A-D-V-I-S-E-R-S.com where you can peruse our research and newsletter archives and sign up for our monthly-ish newsletter. If you like this episode, my only wish is that you please share it with a friend, colleague, or your connections on social media. Sharing is caring. Thanks in advance and ciao for now. The discussion in this podcast is for informational purposes only. Neither Portico Advisors LLC nor its guests plan to update this material and the opinions and conclusions mentioned may change without notice. Neither Portico Advisors LLC nor its guests make any warranty that the information in this podcast is error-free, omission-free, complete, accurate, or reliable. Nothing contained in this podcast should be construed as legal, tax, securities, or investment advice.